From the moment Reverend Dr. Robert Hulse introduced himself as a presidential candidate in 1991, it was apparent he was a simple man with a grand vision. Our son came home that night and uh, said, uh, well, I met one of the candidates. And we said, who was it? And he said, oh, it was, he said his name was Bob. And he said, he said his name was Bob? And he said, yeah. And he said, um, I met him in the cafeteria and he was wearing tennis shoes. And he said his name was Bob. And I, I said to him, should we call you uh, Dr. Bob or Dr. Holtz or president or what should we call you? And he said, well, if first names was, were good enough for Peter and Paul, I think that Bob is good enough for me. The son of a farmer and homemaker from Brownsdale, Minnesota, Bob's leadership and vision have guided his alma mater, Concordia University, through the greatest period of growth in its 118-year history. The institution is thriving, and he's been able to weather a number of changes with that kind of grace and with that optimism that God is bringing to him opportunities. And I think lesser people, and uh, I would count myself among them, would often say, oh, this is a problem. And I, I have never heard that from Dr. Holtz. It's, this is a challenge, this is an opportunity. It, it's never, uh, well, this is the way we've always done it. Uh, this is good enough. It's always looking for uh, what's, the, what's the better way, what's the newest uh, improvement uh, for the campus. During the first decade of Hulse presidency, Concordia became a laptop campus and transitioned from college to a university. Both pretty innovative concepts at the time. Bob was a real visionary in um, spearheading the change from college to university on this campus. I think he saw the impact that it would have on the university um, before other people did and as a result we've become more visible in the community and the church and I think people know that Concordia is alive and well in the Twin Cities. With the academic structure in place, Hulse turned his attention to athletics. In 1997, Concordia made the jump to NCAA Division II. I was very impressed then and still am impressed with with the, with the foresight that President Holst had to make such a big decision, considering how many people across campus that was so strongly opposed to this decision. Bob felt certain that this was the way to go, that we would do well playing on a higher level, and he thought it would attract more students. And his decision <laughs> paid off. The move to Division II more than doubled the number of student athletes at Concordia, including nearly 30 academic All-Americans. 28 conference titles, and four consecutive national championships. Personally, I will always be grateful to President Holtz for the deep commitment he has made to see Concordia University grow and thrive. And I think his decision 13 years ago has put Concordia in a position to be successful for many, many, many more years. Holtz didn't just want to increase the university's visibility on the sports page, he also strove to increase Concordia's overall visibility embarking on a multi-million dollar effort to upgrade the school's infrastructure. In my life as a builder, I've, I've met and know many, many people who are on the other side of projects. Bob looks at, at this building process differently. None of the buildings, none of the activities, none of that was done for his glorification. It was all done to better the university and to serve the young people. In 1993, Concordia introduced a state-of-the-art sports facility, the 70,000-square-foot Gangelhoff Center. That kind of changed the whole structure, the whole mentality of athletics. I think it, it helped move everybody's um, opinion a little bit higher of athletics because it gave us a place to train. It gave us a place to, to let our athletes be serious about their sport. On my recruiting visit, I was sitting in the stands waiting to go meet with Coach Brady and um, I just remember looking around and feeling just at home and feeling like this special connection with the place and it's some, it's, you get a feeling like I just want to play here. In 2003, a 43,000 square foot library technology center was built in the center of campus. It brought a heart to the campus, brought people together, and wasn't just for one discipline, it was for the whole campus and it connected the campus creating a, a meeting place, creating a place to have a common get-together spot. 
Holst also oversaw construction of the Concordia Theater Arts Center, a chapel expansion, and a new apartment-style residence hall capable of housing 300 students. And finally, in 2009, Concordia brought football back to campus with the completion of Seafoam Stadium and the Concordia Dome. Having had the opportunity to actually be one of the first people to play football at Concordia, uh, it's tremendous to be able to see the new Seafoam Stadium. The projects he's done range from athletic to academic to housing to arts and all of those are done to better the school and he has left this school now with the facilities and the economics of the school all intact, ready for the next person to take it and to grow the school further. And he did that humbly and not for his own edification. Without his uh, tenacity as far as uh, extending the, the, what I believe is the gospel uh, from a Lutheran standpoint, uh, this university would not probably be in the position that it is today. When I see the difference on this campus, the changes are amazing. It's um, with all the technology and, and with the new buildings and it's been a very exciting adventure. But I feel that the feeling on campus hasn't changed all that much. I remember Dr. Hull saying that, you know, we don't want to just be in the community, we want to be an integral part of the community. And that the traditional model of higher education institution was, in the past, was more publish or perish. And he said that uh, the, the new model is public or perish. So you have to be a part of the society that you live in. After Holst came to Concordia in 1991, he wasted no time fully integrating the school into the community. What really drew me to, to you know, his vision of the school was sort of how this was a urban college uh, without any walls around it, and, and that's literally and figuratively, there's no walls around this college. One of Holst's early efforts to become one with the community came in 1994 when the university opened its doors for the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Day statewide celebration. He's also been instrumental in opening up our campus um, as a place, a warm and inviting place for important community programs to happen. He was as interested as putting up the dome so that the young people in the neighborhood could have a place to play soccer in the winter as he was in the football team. Concordia's Gangelhoff Center has traditionally been the fourth busiest venue in the Twin Cities area. The university has also opened its classrooms to many nonprofits, including Walter's Wish, a Hispanic mentoring and advising program for St. Paul students, and the Somali Adult Literacy Training Group. As important as Holst thought it was to open the doors to the community, he equally emphasized student involvement throughout the world. During his tenure, Concordia joined Minnesota Campus Compact a coalition that promotes community service, and established Concordia's Community Action Leadership and Learning Center. The energy, enthusiasm, and idealism that Concordia people, students and faculty, have brought to the community in St. Paul could not stand alone. It would only be because Bob Holst, clearly by his life and his work and his teachings, has supported them in that effort. One of the benefits that you get out of a beautiful place like Concordia is the byproducts are our students and faculty who are engaged in the community without necessarily wearing a Concordia sweatshirt and it's not necessarily for Concordia but only because they're good citizens. 
It was the early 1990s when Holtz saw his greatest opportunity for impact in the St. Paul community. During that time, the refugee camps in Thailand were just closing up, and uh, there were a lot of refugees coming here. The Hmong community were in the news consistently, uh, and uh, so I think that, again, with, with his uh, passion and compassion for the community, he uh, reaches out to the population. Each time he uh, reads an article about the Hmong community, he would call me up and he would say, Li Pao, you know, what can Concordia do and how can Concordia support the community? The Hmong Initiative had its roots uh, in, again, Bob bringing this up as a subject, saying this is an opportunity for uh, Concordia to um, make a difference and uh, in the way uh, the Hmong not only assimilate in Minneapolis and St. Paul, but also, mo most importantly, uh, how do we collect these archivals, must, m much of them in oral literature today, in, in oral commentary, uh, before it's gone? The answer came in 2004, when President and Mrs. Holst lived their vision, moving out of their campus home to make room for the world's first and only Center for Hmong Studies, which houses more than 2,000 books, academic papers, artifacts, and audio-video items. Coming here to Concordia, I was really excited that there was a Center for Hmong Studies because there wasn't a place that I knew of that I would be able to go there and familiarize myself with my culture and my identity. It was also a place where many students that I've come to know in the past was able to go there and be able to hang out and uh, learn more about each other and be able to build a professional network. In addition to the Center for Hmong Studies, Holst initiated the development of the Hmong Culture and Language Program, which teaches St. Paul children to celebrate and preserve Hmong traditions. And I think all of these opportunities that he provides really open our students' eyes to our various cultures and um, from a faith perspective, give, give them a view of what God is doing in the world. I see President Holtz as a person who is such a visionary. He sees what needs to be done and reaches out into the community to make it happen. Our time in Papua New Guinea really set the tone for his home ministry because it was there he became interested in missions. But it brought in this business of reaching out to, to people that are not the same color as we are, not the same culture as we are. It's just where it all kind of gelled for him. And he's been doing that ever since. Soon after the family's return from their mission work in Papua New Guinea, Holst received a full scholarship to attend Princeton. While earning his doctorate degree there, Holst served as a teaching assistant and mentored underprepared students. I think that's where Bob got a lot of the idea of doing it here at Concordia. Uh, you know, he's been real big at giving kids with backgrounds that maybe aren't the best as far as schooling is concerned, a chance at Concordia with, with scholarships and with um, a lot of tutoring a lot of individual attention. I think that's kind of where this whole idea started. I think uh, Bob has uh, lived uh, the idea of uh, being student-centered before that became just a phrase in higher education. Uh, Bob invented it. He has worked diligently with this university to see in fact that many of those students do have that opportunity and that talents are not lost. He has helped us to see that the best academic preparation is a preparation that is connected to the real world and is connected to uh, the diverse uh, uh, community in which we live and that the best preparation for the future is to live in a microcosm of the future and that that's what uh, 
uh, Concordia represents uh, for him and, and for uh, our students. In fact, 32% of Concordia's traditional students are people of color, making Concordia the most diverse private university in Minnesota. That diversity, all the different cultures, all the different religions, help prepare the students here to go out into the world and to live in that world. He truly has a missional heart for um, people who may, might not be otherwise able to afford a college education. Of Concordia's nearly 1,200 current traditional students, 33% come from families with incomes of less than $30,000. Those children would not have a chance for higher education without Concordia behind them looking for resources, doing what they can to make sure that, that everybody's got access. College shouldn't just be for people who make $100,000. That's not what Christ would have us to do. We know there are gifted and talented students out there who can make great things of themselves. Uh, Concordia is a place where they have a chance to do that. And I think President Holtz has been at the forefront of promoting that. As a result, the majority of Concordia students are the first in their family to attend college. A full 65% of Concordia's traditional population are first-generation students. When I look around this community and the um, people in the neighborhood who probably don't think that they can achieve something that knowing that they have uh, an institution here that is committed to helping them. Now, obviously they have to have that desire to do that, but um, knowing that it's something that's not unattainable. He's been real big on diversity. That students get to know people of another color, another culture. How, how can we live together? How can the world live together if we don't get to know each other? How can we be accepting of each other if we don't know each other? And he has, has pounded that to the hilt. Holst's efforts have resulted in a 111% increase in students of color throughout his presidency. The legacy that Bob leaves at Concordia is um, is a legacy of opportunity for access to education. And within that opportunity, a lot of, lot of diversity so that they also have the opportunity to get to know people that are a little different than they are and to get to really love them, um, which all comes down to people living together in peace. And that, that is Bob's legacy, I'm sure of that.